Good morning and peace to you. On this, the Sunday after Easter, I come before you grateful for just simply being here another Sunday. With all the disruptions in our lives, days just seem to bleed into each other. We lose track of days. We grieve the connections that we have lost and our longings for a return to what we ascribe as normal seems to conspire in us at times this malaise or a down mood that infiltrates our time-bled moments. In other words, we just kind of feel like blah. Not to mention, talk of opening the economy is on one side, but it is met with the ticker on our news channel that tracks and updates those infected by the coronavirus and the thousands who have died from its effects. In the midst of multiple deaths, both literal and figuratively, and the accompanying grief, spring still shows up in the world. The sun's rays continue to strengthen in the sky. The birds continue to still sing their morning song. And as I said last week, flowers, especially the daffodils, still bloom with radiant defiance against winter's dormancy. This is the time of Easter, the celebration of Christ's resurrection and the truth asserted in our tradition that death does not have the final word and that life is irrepressible. These are all big things, but in this disruptive and angst-filled time, that so naturally breeds the malaise, the down mood, and the overall sense of blah. It benefits to remember the small things, like our breath, like our inhale and our exhale. This thing that testifies in the moment that we are here, simply present. Such is the joy. To encounter the presence of life even in the midst of grief is in part what informs our reflection this morning as we read the story of Thomas. But first, let us hear the hymn, Blessed Assurance. Oh, 
The hymn that we just heard very much ties into last week's message that spoke of the power of story and how the tradition of Easter should not be just told as a story that we trot out and polish up and present once a year with all of its beauty and pomp and regalia. But Easter is a living story that evolves as it touches new contexts and it changes as it winds through the different times of our lives. And we are invited to not only reflect on what happened in the past on that resurrection morn in first century Jerusalem, but what the spirit of Christ and the life of Jesus' ministry means to our world in these present times and how it shapes our struggle for the world to come, the beloved community actualize. The hymn says that this is my story and this is my song, praising my savior all the day long. This timeless refrain not only encouraging us to evaluate the story and song that we are radiating out to the world through our actions, but it compels us to make of our lives a living praise that the world may know the divine hope that liberates and sustains, a hope that delivers us a blessed assurance as we get lost in God's love. This is my story, this is my song. Seeing a story as life is compelling as a metaphor for me. And the reasons why the gospels in particular have always left me just captivated. I find parts of myself in the characters, in their reactions, in their struggles, in their humanity. And I find hope in juxtaposing their journey onto the journey of my own life. Today we'll be reading a part of the journey of the disciple of Thomas. I believe that this is not only a story of him encountering the resurrected Christ, but a story about courage. Let us listen to the passage in the Gospel of John. This morning's scripture reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version Bible, the book of John, chapter 21, verses 19 through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Jesus answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The Word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. This is a compelling story. Unfortunately, this is also the narrative that cemented Thomas, unfairly in my opinion, to be labeled as the skeptic who was chastised by Jesus. Understand that Jerusalem morning, as explained in the first part of this passage, Thomas, whose Aramaic name was Didymos, meaning the twin, was not with the other disciples to whom 
the resurrected Christ first appeared. The same ones who I'm sure were also freaked out as Jesus came and told them, peace be with you. In fact, Jesus probably sensing their collective skepticism or even shock, immediately and with understanding and grace, showed the disciples both his hands and his sides before they can even ask the question. Jesus then blessed and commissioned them. So the disciples go running off and they eventually catch up to their brother Thomas and they go, they tell him the news about how they encountered the risen, uh, the risen Christ and, and, and Tom was like, look, don't play with me. Thomas' insistence, coined as doubt, is even captured in the art by the famous Italian artist Caravaggio in a painting called The Incredulity of St. Thomas. Incredulous, such a strong word. Thomas, a lover of Jesus, he's in grief. He's recalling Jesus' death, the violent trauma that transpired just a few days past. And he said, look, except I shall see on his hands the print of the nails and put my fingers into the point of those nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Then, eight days later, that's a full week and another day. By this time, I am certain some of the other disciples might have been wondering about their own sanity. Jesus reappears to the disciples in a small room, saying, peace to you. He then invites Thomas to touch his wounds. Thomas replies, my Lord and my God. Jesus then offers his affirmations and his blessings. The story of Thomas does not end there. According to some traditions, Thomas is believed to have traveled way beyond the reaches of the Roman Empire. And he was to preach the gospel into open churches, traveling as far as India. In fact, he is now regarded as a patron saint of India. This disciple turned apostle turned saint is seen in many iconographic images with the attribute of a spear because it is thought by some that this Galilean born Jew who was a follower of Jesus was martyred halfway across the world in India when he was ordered to be speared to death, dying in part by the same weapon that took the life of Jesus, the one who he would later call my Lord and my God in that small room. We can never know what was historically accurate fully, but our Christian traditions have Thomas doing a lot. He was courageous and yet he is mired and stuck with the nickname Doubting Thomas. Why? Because the story we just read is often positioned as the antonym or the opposite of what faith looks like, as if perfect faith is predicated on the courage to cast away all feelings of doubt. But what I see in Thomas, in the full humanity of his incredulity, is the seeds that makes faith effective, and the stuff that makes us face the world with a blessed assurance and courage. Simply, just because you have doubts doesn't mean that you don't have faith. And just because at times you are uncertain doesn't mean that you do not have courage. You know, when I think of faith, when I think of courage, I think of Jackie Roosevelt Robinson. Last week on April 15th, baseball in the nation celebrated Jackie Robinson's breaking Major League Baseball's color barrier when he made his historic debut in 1947. Jackie Robinson and later Larry Doby in the American League is rightly remembered for having the courage to put up with all the incredible challenges and roadblocks of being the first black baseball player in a world that was not set up for races to mix. There were taunts, there were death threats, and a whole string of indignities, both large and small, that Jackie had to endure with courage. 
He knew that he was blazing a trail. And as a World War II vet, he had faith in the promise of what this country could be. In many ways, he is seen as an avatar of this unwavering faith that caused him to act courageously in uncertain and adverse times. However, the truth of the matter is, is that he had his doubts. He had many moments of wavering. He had his moments of incredulity. In fact, if it was not for his wife, his rock, Rachel Robinson, the story of faith and courage may have not played out the same way that we remember it in history. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Roger Wilkins said about Rachel, she was not simply the dutiful wife. She had to live through the death threats, endure the vile screams of the fans and watch her husband get knocked down pitch after pitch. She was beautiful and wise and replenished Jackie's strength and courage. Though Jackie Robinson felt tremendous weight, feeling his doubts and uncertainty, especially in the early days, it was Rachel that appeared to him in that small front room of their home, which became a haven of safety. She appeared with the understanding and the grace that allowed him to acknowledge his wounds and be rejuvenated in his faith and refreshed in his courage to keep pressing on. So quickly, what does this mean for us today? It means that in these times that are characterized by the disruption of a world pandemic, in these times when it seems that, as I said last week, all things are crumbling, in these times when we are grieving and anxious and sometimes feeling isolated and dealing with death both literally and figuratively, the idea of living into the promise of Easter may feel like a stretch. There are times when we do not feel the presence of God and at times it feels as if there's more questions than answers. However, just because we have feelings of doubt or express uncertainty. That does not mean that we are unfaithful or lack courage. In fact, in our moments of honesty and vulnerability, God often appears to us, allowing us to acknowledge the wounds and gives us the assurance of God's presence with us. Often we feel pressure to not admit to our feelings of doubt because we're afraid of being judged. We may feel that there's something wrong with us or there's something wrong with the feelings of being shaken when it seems like everyone else is so solid. One pastor even said that we're afraid to admitting to our doubts lest we expose our weak places to others. And I say that it's sometimes it's easier to pretend that everything is okay than to pop that bubble with the pinprick of questions. But here's the thing, when you go back to the scripture, you notice that Jesus does not judge Thomas or the other disciples for that matter. He walks right in, bids them peace, and says at the first time to the disciples, see my wounds. And then later to Thomas, he says, place your hands here and touch there. It's as if he knew that having the feelings of doubt is the most natural and human thing in the world. There. Christ was, even in the midst of uncertainty. And God will be there for us as well, without judgments, only grace. The author and theologian, Reverend Frederick Beekner said, whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you don't have any doubts, you are either kidding yourself or asleep. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. If only we had the faith and courage of Thomas, a faith that is awake and moving, a faith that allowed him to say back in the 11th chapter of John's gospel, when Lazarus had just died and the other disciples were like, let us not go back to Judea with Jesus because they're gonna kill us there. It was Thomas who said, let it be so, 
Let us also go that we may die with him. There was a faith and courage of Thomas that allowed him to become the famed apostle of later traditions that led him to spread the gospel to the far side of the world in India, even unto his execution. And it was a faith and the courage of Thomas that allowed him to speak his truth, to express his feelings of doubt, to risk even being incredulous, and thus opening up and welcoming the appearing presence of Christ that offered peace in the face of death and grief and woundedness. In this time of the coronavirus, we do not need to chase the ghosts of those we perceive to be superheroes of courage and avatars of faith. Even the great Jackie Robinson needed Rachel. But may we be open and honest with our feelings of doubt and uncertainty during these times, knowing that God not only appears offering peace, but encourage us with the Easter promise of life's irrepressibility in the face of death. And God also instills within us the blessed assurance of the divine presence that gives us the courage to keep on keeping on. In this, the National Poetry Month, I'd like to conclude with an excerpt of a poem by an unknown author, and it's entitled, It Takes Courage. It takes strength to be firm. It takes courage to be gentle. It takes strength to conquer. It takes courage to surrender. It takes strength to be certain. It takes courage to doubt. It takes strength to fit in. It takes courage to stand out. It takes strength to feel a friend's pain. It takes courage to feel your own pain. It takes strength to stand alone. It takes courage to lean on another. It takes strength to love. It takes courage to be loved. It takes strength to survive but it takes courage to live. Amen. We close now with part of a prayer that was written by Rabbi Joseph R. Black, the senior rabbi of Temple Emmanuel in Denver, Colorado, and that is a congregation in the Reformed tradition. Let us pray. Our God and God of all people, God of the rich and God of the poor, God of the healthy and God of the afflicted, God of those with health care and God of the uninsured, God of the hoarder and God of the helper, God of those who have no God. We are acutely aware of the gnawing unease that has been inspired by a global pandemic. Everywhere we look, we see apprehension and uncertainty unleashed all around us. The impact of this illness is very real. Its presence is felt every time we wash our hands, clear our throats, or flinch in response to someone coughing behind us. But along with the ugliness, we also have seen simple beauty the outpouring of caring or concerns, communities coming together, doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers laboring with courage and compassion, researchers and students valiantly searching for a cure. It was a psalmist who wrote, who may ascend the mountain of the eternal, who may stand in God's holy place, those with clean hands and a pure heart. We pray that as we wash our hands, for 20 seconds no less, we also might strive to find you, O oh God, in our hearts and our hopes and our homes. O oh, Eternal One, bless all in this sacred place. Keep them healthy. Give them strength to find ways to safeguard our state 
and protect the lives and livelihoods of every one of its citizens. We pray for healing of those who are affected. We pray that those who are healthy will remain so. We pray that this crisis will end and that lives and livelihoods will be spared. To this I say amen and amen. May you go with God and may you go in God's peace.